Welcome to the third part of uh, our podcast and uh, video blog uh, series, uh, The Bold Truth About Hungary. Today's guest, uh, we have uh, the honor to greet uh, Balázs Orbán, who is the political chief of the Prime Minister of Hungary. And my first question is going to go to him, uh, asking what exactly a political chief, a political head of uh, the Prime Minister means, with a special regard uh, in the mission or of the mission that uh, Hungary is trying to play a major and leading role, and that is helping conservatives, not only in Hungary, but uh, in Europe and around the uh, globe, to find common grounds for conversation. Good morning. Thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. It's a very good question. Uh, we are figuring it out right now because it's a new uh, position in the whole co uh, Hungarian constitutional structure. Um, but uh, there are some other e examples uh, worldwide, for example, in the UK. Uh, in the Downing Street 10, there is, um, there is a policy director who is the head of the policy unit as, and his job is, or her job is dedicated directly to the, to the prime minister. The idea behind it is that um, you need to have somebody, um, mainly a politician, who is in the government but not responsible for any governmental branches directly but has, a, has, has an overall view on the political decision-making of, uh, of the government and uh, supports the Prime Minister's uh, strategical uh, decision-makings from this uh, point of view. Uh, this is the job of, uh, of the political director. And um, as everybody knows, Hungary is, um, is, is playing a very special role in, um, in um, conservative, right-wing, Christian, Democrats, uh, um, circles um, in the Western world, and we think that um, but what we are doing is it can be can be seen as a as a as an as an intellectual experience to renew uh, Christian democratic policy, which fits for 21st century uh, challenges. And we have to observe what is the thinking behind it, what is the ideology behind it what is uh, the international circle behind it. And we want to transfer these political, ideological, um, uh, broader questions into direct policy decision makings. Uh, we, what, what happened in the last uh, 12 years, we were not just talking about uh, anti-migration policies, what we introduced them, we were just not just talking about anti-gender and anti-woke policies, but we introduced them. Uh, we were not just talking about the importance of national sovereignty, but we were fighting uh, for it um, on a daily basis in government, uh, in governmental policies. So this is the idea, and that's why, according to the prime minister, at least you need somebody who is taking responsibility for this part. Very well. My sense is that uh, the long-standing idea of the prime minister, and that is uh, the biggest problem Western European politics is uh, coping with or trying to cope with is losing its uh, proper sovereignty, and that is the immediate responsibility uh, to the electorate and the voters because uh, of the, let's call it, the open society approach, which is bringing in non-democratic elements actually into policy making and political decisions, and it is NGOs, um, so-called civil society, which is waging, if not a war, but certainly pressure on political decision makers who've been elected properly. Uh, I believe this is a, a, a huge support actually, what you personally and uh, the, if you like, the institutional structure we've been building up, including the Migration Research Center, you've started your career, Sázadvég, which is a, a, a background institution um, in the classical sense, uh, or today's MCC, uh, the Matthias Corvinus Collegium, uh, and other uh, branches of uh, not the proper government, but the support uh, for uh, pol uh, policy making and politics. What I mean is that regaining uh, sovereignty means that the sole responsibility and therefore the right actually to make decisions about the fate of a country is coming from the, the, the direction of sovereignty and that, that is sovereign uh, uh, electorate and the sovereign political decision-making uh, uh, body, which is the government. That is being lost 
in Western Europe, in most Western European countries. How does that relate actually to the mission? Uh, we've heard that uh, Matthias Corvin's Collegium just opened its uh, Brussels branch. And how does that relate to, say, the US uh, and other parts of uh, the globe, uh, including Israel recently, uh, where there have been elections? Sure. Uh, I would be happy to separate the questions because uh, because the first part you were talking about is also very important. It has a different names and uh, um, and uh, different forms in different Western uh, societies. But for example, in the United States, everybody was talking about the deep state, uh, the technocracy, which is ruling uh, Washington DC and politics. In Western Europe, um, many of them are talking about the influence of NGOs and some some other progressive ideological um, institutions but 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 as as you also said the idea behind it is is that uh, especially in 21st century we have to be able to to fight uh, for the sovereign decision making of the government which should be um, reflected back to the will of the people it's so 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 simple so so the grassroots voters' opinion matters. That's why they elect government. That's why we have so-called representative governments. This idea was invented in the 18th century, 19th century. Since then, we believe in that. So all the forces which are trying to, to, to bypass um, this, uh, this idea are somehow uh, at least political uh, enemies of the democracies and, um, and politicians should be able to fight um, against these uh, trends. But at the meantime, uh, politics cannot be um, um, independent from everything else which is, which is uh, surrounded. Um, you have to understand uh, what is going on in economy, what is going on in culture, what is going on in, in, in the, the political philosophical uh, terms, and you have to transport these kind of ideas into uh, politics. And there is one other aspect, which is probably not so um, clear if you are representing a, a bigger uh, Western European or, or North American uh, nation, because it's a very special problem for small Central European countries. We Hungarians are, although we are in the middle of Europe, we are culturally, uh, I, would, I would say we are an island. We have a very special language, we have a very special culture, very special history. And the, uh, and the reason why we survived in the last 1,000 years because we were able to, to reproduce ourselves, reproduce our political, independent political thinking, independent strategical uh, thinking, uh, reproduce the political elites in every single kind of generation. <coughs> so it's, for an American it's obvious, for a German it's obvious because, because you know, if you are a big power it happens automatically through the institutional uh, system, but if you are uh, a citizen of um, of, a, of a small country, it's not so obvious. So you have to be very focused on on um, on, on building up uh, intellectual institutions like uh, academic institutions, um, um, think tanks, um, uh, talent management programs, um, uh, cultural uh, features, which are uh, which are playing a role, but it's. According to my understanding, it's not a party political role, it's a national strategic role to be able to, to, to influence the mindset of the young generation and convince them that it's worse for them to be patriot. But meanwhile, they are patriot, they are, they are also um, able to compete with other nations, uh, future leaders on the international agenda as well. That's what we're doing at the MCC. Many call this approach uh, populist and autocratic, <laughs> uh, if it's translated to the very simplistic and simplifying language of the political left, especially in, uh, in Europe, but also in the United States. But um, one mission, uh, which Actually, really I don't have any problem with the, with the word uh, uh, populist, because, uh, uh, but I do think that we are not populist, but, uh, but as the left, uh, because as the left is using the word, it means that, that you, um, you try to sell something to the people as a political product, but if you are elected, you are not delivering it. But we are not 
populist in a sense because what what, what we say that we're going to do, we are doing it. Uh, I believe the Prime Minister put it a couple of, maybe six, seven years ago in a way that we are proud populists. It's about, if it's about representing the yeah. real will yeah. of the people yeah. and uh, going for it actually. If you use it this meaning right. that that we have no problem with uh, But my my approach was a little bit different and that probably relates us again to, to what happens in the US or maybe in Israel, in Western Europe, uh, say in Italy. And that is, we all know that uh, the political left, and that is the Greens, uh, the classical socialists, uh, the communists, uh, uh, and the liberals, so, uh, sorry to say, uh, has become or have, al have always been um, internationalist. And that is, for them, it's very easy to unite and go for universal goals. What's the case, what's the issue with the... Uh, with, um, uh, conservatives, because obviously, because of the patriotism you just mentioned, and the uh, obviously uh, national, let's put it that way, nationalistic approach uh, to political issues is going to mean that it's not easy to unite, but definitely there are some common grounds. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a very hard job because because as you said, liberals all over in Seoul, in Stockholm. In, um, in, in Budapest, in Washington DC, they think the same. They have the same top-down approach. They, they have the very similar value system, which is totally independent from the place, from the time, uh, from the historical geopolitical context. They believe in it and they want to change the society through this um, uh, lens. Um, so for them, it's very um, natural to agree on everything 100%. But, but for the national conservatives, it's, it's very hard because, um, because uh, all our policies are decoded in the special historical, uh, cultural, political, uh, geographical context of, of the country. And the whole policy is about that, uh, that your country is first. And, um, and, um, and it's that's the reason why naturally you will not agree 100% on everything. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm totally convinced that on a long term, uh, it's, it, it, it brings a more uh, sustainable international world order because, uh, because it's based on, um, based on the respect. Uh, then, then if everybody understands each other's national interest and the, Accept the idea that that we need to have uh, independent and sovereign and free nation states, and the international politics should be based on the equal cooperation of these nations. Then, then it's uh, the problem management becomes very easy. Meanwhile, if you think that there is a global ideology which should be followed by everybody, it doesn't matter how it fits uh, uh, to the community of people. It it is always constantly causing turbulence and and uh, and the political fragility. So so I think on the long term, this is the only realistic approach which can which can bring um, a stable international uh, system. But it's a hard job, even. Um, even for the Central European uh, cooperation to, to keep it together. Um, uh, but, but I think Central European politicians are, are more, um, they, many of them, they, they understand this, uh, this mission and I'm in the long term quite optimistic. What we see in, 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 um, in international politics is that around 2015, 16, there was a right wing wave uh, in, in Western politics. Uh, Trump was elected, uh, Netanyahu was in power, um, Tories were extremely um, uh, strong, um, Hungary and uh, the V4 cooperation was very strong on the migration issue. Uh, but then there was a, there was a left-wing wave uh, which, which reached the European uh, continent. We remember when we won the election um, uh, this year, April. Uh, we observed that we have never been uh, so strong in, in, in the sense of domestic politics, but, but uh, never been so alone from the international politics point of view. But, but I think the Hungarian election was, was a game changer because since then the situation looks uh, much better. There was, there was a, and, and, and many of them are starting to talk about that probably a new kind of right wave is uh, coming. You mentioned Israel. Um, oh, we didn't talk uh, about uh, Italy yet, but but uh, 
never happened that a very clear right-wing uh, coalition government uh, uh, could win such a huge majority. Sweden, there was also kind of a kind of a political change, and and probably they are not as happy as as um, as it was accepted. But uh, but the Republicans, they they took over um, uh, the 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 house. Um, so something is happening, and I think this trend will 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 continue in the upcoming months, mainly because Western voters they still think or they they think again that the political elites and the governments, left-leaning governments, they are not representing their own interests. And, and it's very obvious in the, in the, especially in Europe, in the, in the case of the war, because, uh, because very few European leaders are representing in this kind of uh, political debate the interest of, of Europe. I don't know whom interest they are representing, but what we see is it's very obvious that this war um, can, be, can be good for Russia, can be probably good for uh, Ukraine or they want to keep up the fight at least. Um, they can, it can be good for China, it can be certainly good for uh, United States, but this war, what is going on right now with the serious risk of escalation and with the going down of the economic uh, facts is definitely not good for the European continent and no one is there to say that. So, so then, then who is responsible for the European voters? That's our only question. Your line of uh, argument is exactly bringing down, uh, us uh, down to the very two points actually I wanted to uh, come to uh, specifically. Based on, uh, as you suggest, mutual respect, uh, a common sense approach and um, the lack of double standards would be much required in Europe. We see that for the past basically 12 years if it's about Hungary, but uh, the same happens uh, with Poland since they have a patriotic government. Um, there are two major issues. They, on they which get the same as a reward, what we get as a punishment. Uh, that exactly <laughs> is the case. And um, we do are standing uh, at the gates of major decisions. If it's about uh, Hungary's uh, access, uh, access to EU money that is due to the country, let's put it that way, because uh, any other suggestion that we shall be or could be deprived of money that is uh, by an algorithm which is clearly set by the treaty is due to Hungary. Uh, is a is a completely complete mis misinterpretation of what is happening. What's your expectation on that ongoing debate? And then, we, if we can return to the the war itself, uh, in we are having this conversation on Friday, and uh, there's a, a series of uh, uh, prime ministers' uh, radio uh, broadcastings um, every or every uh, week or every second week uh, on the Hungarian public radio. And this morning, the prime minister took it this, this way every step towards or every means that is that are being used for sanctions is basically a step towards the war because it is showing towards escalation rather than uh, talking about uh, ceasefire and peace let's start with the with the moment actually we are uh, waiting for and that is uh, we've been in a, a series of conversations finally uh, waiting almost for a year actually for uh, uh, specific issues on which uh, the commission the european institutions had problems we basically have closed the negotiations uh, in a manner that was expected and that is in a constructive manner. But still, the latest news um, are suggesting that uh, they are postponing decisions and uh, um, the whole thing, and that is excess, uh, accessing money that is due to us, is in a limbo. Uh, let me start with the general remark first, because, uh, because uh, I think you it's 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 much more easy to understand uh, the the story if if we do not jump into the technical details immediately because it's definitely not about the technical details. So the the problem is that um, that the whole concept of European Union and European integration was um, was was based on based on a kind of equilibrium between uh, between two different political ideologies, let's call it that way. Um, some some uh, Europeans from the very first moment were saying that the, that the, that the, um, that the end goal of, of, of the European integration is a transnational uh, uh, political and legal institutional body, um, uh, United States of Europe. Um, the others from the very first moment were saying that no, 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 this is not the case. It, we just European integration should always remain a platform 
which is for cooperation for nations and that's through this it can provide stability and economic prosperity. I'm oversimplifying it but but this is the case and the problem is that since we had the Brexit and since uh, um, we strengthened uh, some of the political institutions inside the inside Brussels like like European Parliament uh, which was always the political body of, of European cooperation became stronger and stronger then then what is happening right now is I think that that the, this kind of leftist transnational political ideology it's 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 kidnapped European integration. So what is happening right now is that European institutions are not um, using their legal neutral power to keep together uh, the European integration, but they want to push forward the political agenda. And not only po the parliament. In the parliament, this agenda is supported with two thirds uh, uh, majority, out of question. But the parliament. Uh, that, is, but that's basically a leftist uh, liberal that's basic, majority. That's, let's put it yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's basically a leftist liberal uh, majority. But the problem is that uh, there are some other institutions who are, from the treaty point of view, should 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 remain uh, neutral. Mainly talking about uh, the Commission and talking about the court, but and 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 uh, and the Council also plays a plays a role uh, in that. And there is no European leadership because previously the European um, uh, heads of state were strong enough to, to manage the conflicts, like the German chancellor, the French president um, and, and the head of commission. But, but right now there is no strong leadership in those countries, uh, no strong leadership in the commission. So, so the, the, the agents of political ideologies in the commission, who are just simple commission members, and uh, the pressure which is coming from uh, uh, the political parliament, it is causing this political turbulence. And, and it's not a Hungarian issue. So don't, uh, don't misunderstand it. It's about the future of European uh, integration. And those people are serving political ideologies instead of serving the goal of keeping together uh, the European Union. This is the problem. So we are Hungarians. We are suffering from that, but our position is the only pro-European uh, approach in this kind of conflict. Um, and everybody should be on this side who, for, for whom uh, the future of European Union is important. What is happening right now is that uh, they try to blackmail us uh, because, uh, because of our uh, policies, which were conservative, right-wing, Christian democratic policies as they are blackmailing uh, uh, Poland, for example. They wanted to put pressure on us. They wanted to change the government here, here in Budapest. They were openly supporting the opposition. I think it's, it's unacceptable. And what we did after the election that, <clears throat> that we said <clears throat> that, we, look, we have new ministers. Uh, the political differences are there, but the future of European cooperation is it's, it's even more important. So let's separate the political issues from the technical issues. On the technical issues, there will ne never be uh, conflict because we are on the same side, transparency um, and uh, fair treatment of the money. It's, it's the goal of the Hungarian government as well. And on the political issues, we try to you know, go to court and, 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 and make the political fight somewhere else. And these negotiations were very successful. So we are within ready. a month and a half, basically, because uh, when finally we got the yeah. uh, the uh, specificities on which we had to talk in mid June, basically by the end of July, beginning of August, we were that ready was an to solve it. That's right. That was an agreement. So what we see right now is is that uh, the openness is is uh, is is here on the Hungarian government side. We want to make an agreement. I think morally, their position in the long term it's not sustainable. So blocking the money. Uh, from one government, which is a joint loan project. So my grandchildren should repay that kind of money what we don't get for the European Union. You know, it's just morally, it's, 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 it's an intolerable uh, position. So I'm, I'm, I'm still, optimism that, so still optimistic that this kind of common sense uh, will emerge. But, uh, but, but right now the, very, the tension is uh, very high not because of the negotiations, because of the uh, other political issues, like the joint loan project um, um, in connection with Ukraine, 
where v it has nothing to do with the money, but the Hungarian position is very, uh, very clear. In general, we do not support joint uh, loan projects. We are very happy to, uh, to, to support the Ukrainians on a bilateral meaning from our own state budget. Uh, we will give them the money. But in general, these joint loan projects are not um, a useful ways or a useful tools um, uh, to keep together the European integration. So this is what is causing a political turbulence. The past two, day, two three days we've seen some uh, new perspectives emerging on behalf of the Commission, some commissioners at least, and that is suggesting that it's not only say the loan, that, that is the 18 billion uh, uh, euros that uh, would be due to Ukraine uh, by a common decision that is in the way of uh, an agreement, but also the minimum wage, uh, sorry, the minimum tax uh, rate in, uh, in Europe, and other issues, common decision making issues that might come to the table. What do you make of that actually? As you suggested, technicalities, which, is, which are common sense elements actually of our legal system, of our decision making, transparency systems, very obviously could be separated and we were successful to negotiate. But we see a political element that is coming back again and again. Well, I, I think that it goes against the treaties then, because, uh, because uh, a joint loan project, which was about uh, to tackle the negative economic consequences of, um, of, uh, of the coronavirus crisis, has nothing to do with European foreign policy, has nothing to do with global minimum tax, and so on and so on. So, so this kind of um, combination of things is, uh, is very dangerous. Um, and, um, and, and we don't think that we should put together um, these issues. But, um, <clears throat> but look, it, if you don't... So Hungary's uh, position is sustainable. They cannot corner us. They, they will not be able to put uh, pressure on us. We are ready to make an agreement. But, uh, but we are able to, um, uh, to manage our uh, economy. We, would, we are very optimistic, but, uh, but I think uh, to use uh, uh, technical, neutral EU financial tools for political purposes, it, what is the end of it? It's, it's, it's the blowing up of the whole European Union. And, and as we were talking about, it's not about the position in connection with Ukraine, because, uh, because the Poles, are getting the same treatment. So, so, so it's, it's, it's really about political ideology. Uh, liberals, uh, um, uh, socialists, Greens, they want, to, uh, they, win, they want to politically hunt down all the conservative forces. And what I keep, keep telling to them in Brussels is that imagine the situation reverse. Like, like there is a strong uh, conservative government in Italy, then in Spain, then in France, and the European Parliament uh, majority um, uh, turns into a conservative direction, and they start to put political pressure on, on for example, Sweden or the Netherlands, that if you accept uh, uh, gay marriage, then you don't get the EU fund. So it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's a nonsense idea. And then why are they doing that in a reverse way? Let, that, let these words and arguing uh, argument be the final, the concluding statements for today, because uh, uh, the confines of the blog uh, is something like 20, 25 minutes. I presume and my expectation is that we are going to have other topics to talk about in the future. So I'm, I really thank for Balazs' uh, contribution this uh, morning. And I'm very much looking forward to continuing it uh, sometimes in the spring. Very obviously, the, put, uh, the change of the political situation is going to give us lots of ammunition for further discussions. Thank you for your attention.